I updated my PC and now it won't post. I've changed motherboards, RAM, and nothing will get it to post. Short of swapping CPUs or drives, I'm not sure what else to do. This computer is everything to me right now. It has an AMD Ryzen 9 7900X in it, an RTX 3080 Ti, 32 gigs of Trident Z DDR5, an X670 E Gigabyte Aorus Master Elite motherboard, and a two terabyte M.2. This here is that viewer's broken gaming PC. And uh, no post is no good, so we're gonna try to fix it in this video. Now, short of any quick fix, say clearing the CMOS or correcting a simple wiring mistake, I'm leaning towards the graphics card as the likely culprit since it wasn't actually mentioned at all in the owner's description. I find it odd that he was able to replace the motherboard so handily, but not the card, which is usually one of the first things to swap out. The motherboard is one of the last resorts in my book because you literally have to disassemble your entire system to get to it. Uh, so if it gets that deep into, you know, part swapping, at, at that point, I would hope you have already swapped your graphics card. But I understand that some folks just don't have extras laying around. Maybe he had an extra X670 or B650 board. I don't really know. And for all I know, he also could have swapped the graphics card and just failed to mention it. It doesn't matter for us though. We as computer technicians, repair people, we have to verify these claims with our own eyes. We can't just take their word for it. It's not that we don't trust individual owners. We just can't make a habit of trusting anybody in this business. We'll do our best to verify these claims if it comes to it. Uh, try, of course, powering on and seeing if we can fix this supposed no post issue. Are you ready? Stay with me. The new A115 air cooler from Corsair packs two AF140 Elite fans into a dual tower array with six beefy 6mm heat pipes for powerful heat transfer. Pre-applied XTM70 thermal paste and slim slide and lock fan mounts add to the ergonomics, while 90 nickel-plated cooling fins and an overhauled retention system ensure excellent cooling efficiency. The A115 supports the latest sockets for both Intel and AMD and ships with Corsair's five-year warranty for peace of mind. Learn more by clicking the link below. Hey there, and welcome to Fix or Flop. In this playlist, we attempt to fix viewer systems in and around the Orlando, Florida area for free. So if you uh, have a broken system and you're willing to meet in person to drop off and pick it back up, I will uh, give it my best shot and I will charge you zero dollars and zero cents in the process. We of course can monetize these videos on sites like YouTube and that's how I make my money. It, it just doesn't make any sense at all to charge folks when frankly, I could be making a lot more just documenting these processes. So I uh, really appreciate your viewership. It's why we can continue doing what we're doing, provide free parts when necessary and uh, put out hopefully semi-informative videos. They'll also likely be entertaining at times because I make complete fools of myself in the process. All right, here we go. Uh, power on there, power on up front. Let's see if we get a post. Now it powers on right away, which is as described, that's good. We need to make sure that uh, what we're seeing here lines up with what the viewer has uh, listed in his description. We'll say it doesn't sound like fan curves have ramped down at all. So I actually don't think at this point it is posting. So it's not necessarily that we don't have picture out. That's probably a good sign because this is an expensive 3080 Ti here. It likely is something else. In fact, do we have a Dr. Debug LED? Ooh. We do. So this has been happening for about three or four minutes now. You can see the codes being cycled through are fairly repetitious. So double zero, 15, 46, those are the three you see the most. And at this point I would normally say we're training memory, but uh, this, this is, and this is a bigger issue. This is not memory training. See, a lot of folks get really nervous around the power process for AM5, especially after building for the first time, you plug things in, you power it on, and you don't get anything for like two or three minutes on screen. You just get weird like sequences of debug codes, right? Like you're seeing here, except in this case, obviously it's, it's more repetitious than it should be. There's a separate issue going on. But I do wanna mention that now if you are building an AM5 system for the first time and it takes two or three minutes to boot, that is totally normal. Memory takes a long time to train on this platform and so uh, don't freak out you know give it two or three minutes at the most that's about how long it should take if you're using four dims and fairly high capacity ones at that but uh, after that first boot it shouldn't take anywhere near that long again next thing i want to try is removing both the dims and powering the system on this way and this is actually an underrated trick i think because uh, you can learn a lot about whether or not your DRAM is actually to blame by doing this. See, obviously the system's not going to post without RAM, but if it repeats the exact same symptoms without RAM installed, then we know that it's not RAM related, or at least likely isn't 
RAM related. I've seen weirder things, but this is usually a good way to rule it out. Oh, and would you look at that? A different debug code this time around. We're stuck at 21. And we've just a solid red LED for DRAM now. No cycling between CPU and RAM like we saw before. Every time you power on a computer, it goes to what we call a post process, a power on self test. It's going to check to make sure that a CPU is installed and that it's compatible with the BIOS currently loaded onto the motherboard. It's going to make sure that system RAM is present. It's going to make sure that a discrete card is installed. If there's no discrete card, okay, is there integrated graphics? If there are no integrated graphics, then we have another problem. It's running through all these checks very quickly, usually in a fairly sustained order from CPU to RAM to display out, etc. And if it notices any issues, it will halt at that process. In this case, it's halted at RAM. There is no RAM. Now, I'm not sure if what we're seeing here is a check that happens before the symptom you saw previously, but this at least kind of helps us hone in on the supposed issue. So based on what the motherboard's told us so far, I don't suspect we have a power delivery issue of any kind, and I don't suspect we have a dead or defective graphics card. So let's install a single known working DDR5 DIMM from a different kit entirely to see if this fixes the issue. If this doesn't work, I'll shift my attention to the motherboard and the CPU, probably the socket as well. I've seen bent pins cause issues like this. We might have a dead memory channel. Maybe we have two dead memory channels, at which point I likely blame the CPU and we can verify that uh, separately. But uh, if your CPU isn't communicating with your RAM and you verify that your RAM works in other rigs, then it's the CPU more than likely to blame. Let's see if we get any reaction here with a known working single stick. Hmm, looks like a whole lot of nothing. And I think I spot a fairly repetitive debug LED sequence, just like before. Alrighty, we have a bigger problem on our hands than just a DDR5 kit. I'm going to dive into the socket now. I'm just, I have a hunch. Now I just noticed, but well, this, this is like extremely hot to the touch. I can't keep my finger there for longer than, you know, a split second. It is uh, just way harder than I'm used to. And I think something's wrong here. I'm not sure if it's related to what we were seeing, but it's almost as if we don't have flow. Maybe the pump is dead. I didn't actually pay attention to that because I didn't think that was what we were supposed to be focusing on here. But, uh, yeah, this is, this is way too hot. Let's get into the socket here. Let's take this chip out, which um, is actually quite a bit cooler than the cold plate of the AIO, which is, well, that's a bit of a relief. And uh, well, at first glance, the socket looks okay. You can see in there, no bent or missing pins. We are good to go. Underside of the chip also looks very clean. Nothing obstructing contact with these pads. So. Uh, or at least physically okay here as well. I hesitate to do this, at risk of frying my own CPU here, but I don't really see a way around it. Without swapping the motherboard, I think the only other option is to swap the CPU. The symptom is just too specific. The, the debug codes are just too repeatable for me to focus on really anything else. It doesn't look like power at all is to blame. I don't think it's the graphics card to blame. I'm gonna throw my 7600X into this board and see if we can repeat the issue. If we can, then I'm keen on swapping out the motherboard. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know what else to do here. I'm also gonna pay attention to this cooler, which mind you is still extremely, extremely hot. Something's not right here. This thing is still scalding. At this point, some of you might be thinking, well, Greg, maybe it's mounting pressure. Maybe the AIO wasn't mounted properly and that's why we're getting these strange debug LED cycles. But uh, you have to remember like the, the cold plate, <laughs> we call it the cold plate, but it's really supposed to be hot while under load, um, is extremely hot from the Lee and Lee AIO. So if this block is getting hot, then presumably it's pulling, it's pulling heat from the chip. So I think it's mounted properly. And to that end, the thermal paste was spread appropriately for that as well. I'm gonna use a Thermal Grizzly cryo sheet for this temporary testing here. It's enough thermal paste to worry about. And uh, I'm just gonna make sure this time around, not that it wasn't before, uh, that we just sandwich this down good and tight. Good and tight. I'm gonna keep the system laid down flat for this one. We're gonna power on and uh, I'm gonna check the pump. Let's see if I can feel fluid. This is not, why is it not powering on now? Huh? What's going on? It just doesn't want to power on now? I've never seen this before, where just swapping a CPU to another known and working one 
prevents the system from now powering on outright. I mean, we're getting low voltage. It looks like five volt here, more than likely to the power LED, but it ain't doing nothing. Even with a different power supply, known and working, and the graphics card taken out, still nothing. We get the lit power button on the board, but no legit power on. <sighs> yeah. Um, there's something fishy going on here. So here's what's happening. This motherboard is coming out. And uh, I fear we will be replacing this. Um, and I think, if I recall correctly, the viewer already did. I wonder if this is the old board or the new board. It doesn't matter. Either way, I'm getting some weird vibes from this platform at this point. Too many strange things happening. Is this not... Is this still stuck somewhere? Is it still bolted in? Ah, yes. One screw under this uh, little M.2 heat plate. Okay, and here we go. You know what I'm noticing, and I'm not sure how well the camera's gonna pick this up. I'm gonna set this uh, 7600X back in here, and you might be able to tell how lopsided the chip is sitting in the socket. So closer to the lens, so closer to this section here, you can see the chip kind of sticks up from the socket a bit, but then closer to the back, it sits more recessed. Let me see if I can get the focus to jam back there. There you go. So you can see now it's, uh, yeah, it's flush back there and not flush up front. I have never noticed that before. I don't think that's how this is supposed to sit, but I've tried both chips and they both sit this way. I'm afraid to apply force because I don't want to bend the uh, pins underneath, but the way that it's sitting now, like something's just, something's not right. Maybe if I try installing from this side here, this is going to be slightly cringy. But it just, yeah, see, look, now it sits more flush there and it doesn't want to go down on the top now. So let me change focus again. You can see now the back side is sitting upright and uh, the front side is sitting flush. This, this socket is warped. Now, thankfully, none of the pins look to be damaged, but uh, yeah, I think that the plastic framing around the socket, the tolerances there are just a little too tight. Um, so what I'm going to do, this is, again, this is also going to be a bit cringy. I'm going to apply a bit of force to get the CPU to sit all the way in. I think it will with just a, just a, a small push. And then we'll try powering back on. At this point, I'm ready to replace the motherboard. But if we can get this to work again, um, then uh, we, we might be okay sticking with this. You just have to note this going forward. If you replace a CPU or swap one out with another, just uh, mind the tolerances of the socket. It might have been warped from the heat now that I'm thinking about it, from that AIO. So here we go then, dropping a CPU back in. I'm gonna try to install this the way I normally would. I'm just gonna kind of set it like that. And you can see the right side is all the way in, and the left side is not. I'm gonna push down a bit here, apply a bit of pressure. Look at that, it goes all the way back in. Let's see if it's removable. Oh yeah, that's still fairly easy to do. So that's, uh, that's good to know. So it sits, we're gonna just push couple places, make sure it's all the way in. This is cringy, please don't do this if you have a non-warp socket, which I imagine most of you don't. And then we're gonna just uh, batten down the hatches and let's see if we get a post now. I bet you it at least powers on again. Now I'm gonna try powering this on outside of the case with uh, a secondary power supply and a stock AMD cooler just to rule out we have a heating issue. I don't think the symptom we were seeing was an overheating one, but I do wanna look further into the AIO because uh, something, something weird's going on there. So power on the power supply. I think we actually have that power button here. Let's see. All right, look at that. Power's right up. And we do have a single known working stick of DDR5 in there. So we're pretty much just testing the CPU and the motherboard at this point to see if what we did fixes anything. 12 seconds later. Mm, it's doing the exact same thing as before. Double zero, 15, 46. Uh, all right, only one thing left to do then since we've pretty much tested everything in this dang rig. We're gonna swap his CPU back out for my known working 7600. If we can get the same symptom to be repeated, it's a motherboard swap. That's about all we have left to isolate. And just in case you're wondering, this symptom is exhibited with this known working DIMM in every single slot, which tells us this likely isn't a dead memory channel issue. But wouldn't you know, still a black screen, still the exact same symptom with my CPU. So this is looking like a motherboard swap, plain and simple. Could I start probing places? Sure. 
it's not really my forte. It's not something I'm, I'm super confident in, so I prefer to avoid it if I can. It just seems like, given my resources, the most cost-effective and time-effective thing to do is swap the board. And I think I have almost an exact replacement already in the closet. Ah, oh, would you look at here? We've got an X670 Aorus Master. Wait. This box is empty. Where? Where am I using that motherboard? I don't know where it went. Uh, do we have any others? Most of this is Intel or AM4. We do have a couple B650s. These are obviously downgrades, but they'll still get the job done. It's up to him. I mean, if he's okay with this, I can get this up and running today. I'll message him and uh, we'll go from there. Suppose I should first check though that this replacement motherboard is actually the solution before bringing it up to him. It is very cluttered around this desk now. Just been swapping so many things out. Didn't expect this one to be as complicated as it was, but uh, hopefully this motherboard swap will do the trick. So we're gonna power on. I have to jump these power pins manually. Right there, alrighty. And we don't have a Dr. Debug uh, on this board. I'm not sure if we even have debug LEDs. We do. So it looks like right now we are on the DRAM Amber LED. I have his original RAM in here, by the way, along with his original CPU in hopes that we get something. They do have very basic integrated graphics. So we should get a picture out if this in fact works. If. Ooh. It's not, yes, alrighty. So this is a great start. Again, I'm gonna verify that he's okay with this B650 board. Uh, again, he's not gonna have to pay for it, but I understand some folks might want the higher end chipsets if they're running expand, you know, expandable storage, let's say, or if they have multiple USB devices to plug in or something. So I'm gonna verify that with him and then I'm going to test this AIO. I just wanna make sure this thing's okay before I send it back to him because this was oddly hot. I might even get out the flare imaging camera and see uh, uh, if we've got proper circulation. There were issues with some earlier Galahad AIOs from Lee and Lee, and uh, at first glance, I can't tell if this is one of those or not, but it's worth checking. Now we did receive the green light from the owner to go ahead and replace the board with this B651. He thinks it'll be fine. I told him we could get an exact replacement, but it'll take a few days uh, just because I don't have one here. But uh, he says the B650 is fine. So we'll put that back in here. We'll hook up his Lee and Lee AIO once again, and then we'll hop into the BIOS, assuming everything still works as is with the original power supply in the original case. And uh, we'll check temps just to, again, make sure that his AIO isn't in fact clogged or has a dead pump. I'm gonna make sure this block is again, good and tight over the CPU, something like that. And then we'll tighten this down on both sides. I think I'm gonna try booting up at first without a discrete card installed, just, just in case. Remember we do have that uh, very basic integrated graphics processor in the 7900X this time around. I think it's really nice that AMD added that for Zen 4. Here we go. I swear, somebody, somebody else, not me, turn that power strip off. That needs to stop happening. Whew, my heart sank. <laughs> that was uh, that was not cool. I don't know how I keep managing to turn that off. Alrighty, oh look at that, boots right up, right away. That was extremely fast. And uh, back to uh, the TPM being reset. So, alrighty, we can. Uh, can power off again. We'll install the graphics card now. And look at there. There's our post right away. This baby wants to fire up and go. So uh, let me reset the TPM and we'll hop into the BIOS and check those CPU temps. Oh yeah, that is looking good. Now this might seem a bit alarming to some of you. Well, Greg, 40 degrees or higher is a, it's, it's a little too high for a CPU that's just idling. Uh, in reality, it's it's really not that big a deal. What I'm more concerned with here is the steady de uh, steady incline, I should say, uh, of temperature. So if we start to see this creep up into the 50s and then into the 60s, that would suggest to me that there's either something wrong with the circulation inside the closed loop or um, the CPU is just getting fed way too much voltage 
for some unknown reason. Looks to be right now though pretty stable and of course the motherboard temps are also in check. And after a bit of time has passed, you can see temperatures have pretty much leveled off. They aren't going anywhere. In fact, this is after enabling XMP and I've also tinkered with voltage just a bit. I noticed that it was a bit high in auto, which a lot of boards tend to do nowadays. It's a kind of a shame because you're just pushing more voltage than necessary to achieve a certain frequency. Your CPU could probably operate uh, with a lower V-core than the auto function. So I've actually set a healthy offset here. You can see we're somewhere around 1.25 now. I'm fairly confident this system is going to run just fine and the temperatures are not going to overwhelm the user while gaming or being productive somewhere else. Also for peace of mind's sake, make sure that we loaded into Windows. You get a bunch of stuff popping up right now that's not working because we're not connected to the internet. Uh, but this is just that extra peace of mind. You had an operating system on one of the boot drives. Both are connected. Pretty much everything is back to the way it was except for the motherboard. The motherboard is the one thing we swapped. And uh, well, that's what fixed our weird no post issue. Whew, this one was a real doozy then. You know, replacing a motherboard, anytime you have to do that, it's just, it's gonna take a while. You have to practically rebuild the system from the ground up and troubleshoot along the way because you weren't actually sure if it's going to lead to a motherboard replacement. In this case, it did. And I know some of you are gonna be upset that we didn't actually repair what was wrong specifically with the board in question, uh, but oftentimes it's just not as feasible to, to do that. I mean, could I start probing around? Sure. It's First off, it's not my cup of tea. It's not something I'm, I'm very proficient in. Uh, but in as much you have to weigh the the economics of it all. I mean, you're probably going to pay as much in labor alone to have a board like that fixed uh, as you would just to buy a replacement. Now, some boards, you know, they're four, five, six hundred dollars. They might be worth having them, you know, fixed by a by a technician. But uh, usually just replacing the component, if the component's defective, that is the cost effective and usually the time effective solution as well. Uh, my dad, for example, he's an electrical engineer. He's been one for 35 years. He's uh, worked for a very large company and uh, fixed MRs, CTs, uh, x-ray machines in, in hospitals. And so anytime a tech would call him and complain about an issue, he would do essentially what we do here, just to a different scale, right? He would come in, he would replicate the issue, he would try to narrow down what part, what component was wrong. Usually it's either a circuit board or a motor or something like that. He'd pull that part out and then he would replace said part. He wouldn't, you know, just focus on that board specifically and try to find, oh, this one resistor, this one MOSFET's broken, yada, yada. It's just, they, they don't do that. You know, I know some do, but my dad doesn't. My dad's an electrical engineer. He's probably as qualified as anybody to be working on a board level, but he doesn't because it's not cost effective. I remember he used to be on the phone all the time in the car calling the parts store, not the parts store, but the, the, the vendor for that component, asking for the part number and would have to take it from his house where they'd ship it to the hospital, pop that part back in, and then hopefully X-ray, MR, CT, whatever he's working on is back up and running again. Some might be capable of more specific repair, but it doesn't always mean it's the most economical. I just wanted to throw that out there because sometimes we get accused of like not actually fixing them. Well, you're not fixing the problem, you're just replacing the problem. Yes, and by doing so, we are fixing it. The net result is the viewer has a system that is working again. It looks really cool. Plenty of RGB throughout this thing and it's ready to game. It's ready to be productive, whatever he has in mind. Now again, if you have a broken system and you live in or around Orlando, Florida and you want a chance to have it fixed for free like you saw on this one, be sure to submit a form. It is linked in the video description. Uh, just have to submit your specs, describe the issue that you're seeing and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. There are several in the queue, uh, so I have to be a bit choosy. I tend to pick hardware-based issues more often than not, just because they're more camera-friendly, and frankly, that's more of my strong suit than the software stuff. Uh, but if you have an issue, it might be worth just, uh, just submitting an entry. Who knows? Um, I know some folks are like, wow, I never thought you would pick me. And here we are. So uh, yeah, yeah, nothing really to lose. I appreciate those who have been, um, you know, just avid and, and showing up on time to these meetings. It's impressive how I, to date, knock on wood, never had a negative encounter with anyone. Seriously though, not a single negative thing to say about really anyone that we've worked with so far. So um, just, just super appreciative. And of course, appreciative to all of you who uh, are watching around the world. If you wanna get subscribed, click that red subscribe button. Consider liking the video if you thought it was cool and leave a comment down below. Let me know what you guys thought was wrong with this. Uh, if you, you know, agreed with the troubleshooting procedure. Sometimes I do things a bit out of order and I get called out for that. That's totally fine. Sometimes I like just approaching things off the cuff. Maybe I, I have a sneaking suspicion that it's something that it ends up not being and I look silly for it. You know, I like kind of just jumping in the deep end 
and uh, showing you what, what could happen, what goes wrong if you make the wrong assumption about a broken system like this. There's a lot to learn, there's a lot I am still learning, and I'm just grateful that you guys are still here coming along for the ride. Again, thank you so much for watching, and thanks for learning with me. By the way, just something I'm filming uh, as an extra after the fact. I did talk with the owner, and if you recall, he already replaced the original motherboard in here, uh, but uh, that didn't end up supposedly fixing his issue, so he put the original back in here. That was the one we were working with in this video. He said the one he replaced it with was like a, an Elite or a something like this, another, another gigabyte motherboard. But uh, it's likely that he might have miswired something there. Maybe he damaged the socket when swapping CPUs over. I, I, somehow I doubt that because he's didn't, he didn't damage this one. Um, but I, I can't really account for what he was running into with that second board. Either the board was just DOA or it was some other simple mistake more than likely. But uh, that original board was the one that was giving him trouble to begin with. And he actually, I suppose we should look at it this way, he actually was on the right track. He replaced the problem. It just ended up creating a different problem. And that was around the time he gave up on it. So. Uh, he was on the right track. If you're watching, you were on the right track, but uh, I appreciate nonetheless reaching out to have it fixed here.